like to, my name is Martin Turner. I'd like to welcome you here this morning and to give the official welcome to open the technical sessions. We will call upon Alvin Ives, the president of the North American Catalysis Society. Thank you, Martin. Glad to see we have a lot of early risers here this morning. Um, it's my pleasure as the president of this society to uh, open this meeting and to welcome you all here. I think the Canadian Analysis Club has done an excellent job in accruing uh, a lot of interesting talks. You notice we have multiple sessions, so we'll be getting a lot of exercise as we move from one to another. Uh, I've been in touch with them during the course of this meeting. I'm very pleased that uh, the attendance has been so good. Uh, last time I heard, we probably have right around a thousand registrants in one form or another. So it's certainly uh, a good size, perhaps one of the larger meetings we've had. So I think that's uh, perhaps a good sign for analysis. But anyway, I would just like to welcome you all here uh, and enjoy the, uh, the meeting. And I will turn this uh, microphone back to the Mark. Thank you. I wanted to make a few remarks on behalf of the organizing committee to uh, welcome you. I had. Uh, one unfortunate announcement I made last night I'd like to repeat and that John Moffat is the co-chairman of this meeting and he's not here this week. His wife is having heart surgery scheduled today and so he will be with her this week and that's a, a, a sad thing but it's a reality. On that note, there are over 500 presentations here today or this week and emergencies do happen and we don't know what situations people are in we're anticipating and maybe one or two presentations that are not made and for what reasons we don't know but, but things like that do happen. Another thing I draw your attention to is that Keith Hall is honored as being the honorary chairman of this meeting. Keith's uh, obituary is written up and it's a fine job that Kurt Connor has done. I was really impressed with it. And I wanted to make one point about Keith. Among his many accomplishments Keith was instrumental in the Canadian Catalysis Club becoming part of the North American <coughs> Union, of North American society. And that is something that we in Canada have benefited from greatly and will always be indebted to Keith for his work in getting us, to, allowing us to become <coughs> part of the society. What also mentioned, as I did last night, that the fourth North American meeting was held in Toronto. So this is the second time, and we're really delighted to have the meeting in Canada again. It's a, it's a privilege and honor for us. This is an expensive meeting, as you've noticed, uh, and we, I'd like to thank all of our donors. We've got a lot of industrial support here. And I wanted to make a point to all of you. For these kind of meetings to be financially successful, we need money. And we've got money, we're, we're going to have a small surplus at this meeting. But it, the reason for that is because the industrial people have helped a lot. But all of you need to think about the organizations you work for and ensure that your organization makes a contribution to the catalysis meeting. And I'd like to hold up Engelhard as an example. Engelhard made their donation early, that helped a lot. They were also very generous. And there was a team approach in Engelhard. What they did was a lot of different departments got together and contributed a little bit. And so we ended up with a generous donation from them. I'd like to encourage all of you to go back to your organization and the next time try to get a, several departments to come together and make a contribution to the meeting. The computer projection facilities that we have here today are an extra that we would have probably done without if we had not had the general support from industry. There are a lot of students. We have 150 students here who have subsidized uh, cost of attendance. There would not have been as many if it had not been for the generous contributions. So having harangued you on costs, I will just say one more financial thing, and that is, this is an expensive meeting. Your registration fees exceed half a million dollars. And if you think that the cost of attending the meeting is, say, four times the registration fee, that's $2 million that was spent to come to this meeting. And if you think about the, 
the time and effort to prepare the presentations that are made here. There's 500 presentations. It's probably a factor of 10 times, which brings us up to $20 million. And the cost of doing the research is probably another order of magnitude. That's $200 million. So today, this week, there's $200 million worth of research available to all of you. That's a good investment. Please take advantage of the information that's available to you, and I hope you really do get your money's worth. And now I'd like to call on uh, Chuck Mims, who's our chairman of local arrangements, who is going to be giving the announcements to you all week. And they won't be as long as the ones this morning. I've had plenty, many people ask me how to find their way around this hotel, so part of my message here will be that you oriented to the meeting. And the first slide has a picture of this side of the hotel, the convention center. We are where the red dot is, you are here. I can't reach my mouth. The red dot is where we are for this meeting. And on this level, there are two resources for each speaker. There's the speaker's breakfast room, which will be held in the Queen's Key, it's right out the right of the registration desk. Seven in the morning, but it's good breakfast. And the speaker ready room is around the corner to the left of the registration desk, and we have all of the uh, AV facilities duplicated in that room. If you are planning to use your laptop to do a presentation, there's a setup in there that will tell you whether you've got the electrons going correctly or not. <laughs> Upstairs, if you go out of this hall to the escalator and go up to the next level, you're on the, on the upper level where the Metropolitan Ballroom is. And in the Metropolitan Ballroom, we will have the exhibits, which will open right after this talk. Uh, and run until five today because of the boat crew. Coffee breaks will also be in that, uh, in that place because the exhibitors like to have a lot of traffic through their exhibits. So it will be coffee service at the back of that, on the back wall of the Metropolitan Ballroom at the times indicated, right after the plenary, until the uh, breakout session start, and then the afternoon there's break between 3 and 3. The, uh, we also are experimenting with a cash lunch bar today. The weather looks pretty good, so we'll see how many people take advantage of that, but we're going to try it, and if it's a success, then the hotel will consent to uh, offer it in the future when it's raining outside. Upstairs will also have a poster session. Uh, the poster boards are already set up and available for poster presenters to start putting their presentation up right after this meeting. We'll have a volunteer in there to show you. If you can't find your poster board, we'll help you with, uh, with putting your poster up. And presenters for the first session, for which there is a reception tomorrow night, including more food. Uh, we should, we'd like you to have them up today sometime, but at the very latest by first thing uh, tomorrow morning. <coughs> Earlier there after more traffic to get by your Now, those of you who made it over to this room and were in the reception last night know how to get between the two sides of the hotel. You have to find that little breezeway in the sky. All of the, there will be one session in this room, and six of the remaining seven will be over where we had the reception last night. <coughs> the other ballroom, Salon A, B, and C, is the ballroom where we had the reception last night. And it's going to be divided into three, three rooms, and there are two additional, or three additional venues over on that side. We're going to have, and uh, there's also been a companion's room for companions who want to find out what they can do in Toronto during this particular day. We have people knowledgeable in there to help them keep planning that day. And that will be open from 8 to 12 uh, today. Well, I wanted to remind you that if you haven't seen the program in detail yet, the keynotes for the individual sessions start at a different time. They start a little bit earlier to give our keynote speakers a little more time to talk. So nine, there's 9.45 start time for keynotes uh, in the morning session and, and 10 o'clock time for sessions that do not have a keynote speaker scheduled uh, for that particular session. Uh, and you know about the hospitality suite, but you look at some of your eyeballs right there. <laughs> Computer projection is a duplication as best we could of what the ACS drive.
tried out in San Diego in April for the first time. We had switch boxes at every, at every room that allow multiple computers to be hooked up any time. And then when it's your turn to use your computer, you push the button on the switch box that corresponds to the number on the cable you plug into the back of your computer. We have the switch box with two outlets uh, in the speaker that you I said earlier. And then that box is hooked to a single projector. And we ask you, if, uh, if you're going to use your computer, go in the break immediately preceding your call. And get your computer going, there's a power bar, and you leave your computer on uh, AC adapter through the session if it's possible. And that way, all you have to do when you start your talk is go and push the, your number button, and your presentation should be there when mine is now. That's all. And we also have overhead projectors and the regular camera cells. Tonight, there's both crews. We were nervously watch, watching the weather, and I'll say a little more about that in a second. It is uh, very close to this building. The uh, strange looking shape in the upper right hand corner is the hotel. And so you go out to the street that between the two, walk west three blocks. It's impossible to miss this. And you will come to a slip where there are a lot of boats, cruise boats, moored. And that is uh, Queen, and Queen's Key is the pier sticking out there. That's pronounced key. And, uh, and we will have two and maybe three boats. We actually were oversubscribed last night for the cruise, so we may actually have three boats. Um, there is a working way down to the right on the slide. We will have guys stationed in friendly looking red jackets that if you start to wander off into downtown Toronto instead of towards the boat, we'll just have to see if that's really where you want to go. We also have buses scheduled. We paid this fee to, to Murphy, the god of rain, and uh, decided to schedule some buses just in case. And those of you who would like to spend 15 minutes in traffic rather than three minutes walking, you can certainly take advantage of that. <laughs> They'll be down in front of the main market of the hotel. <laughs> we ask you, the boat leaves the dock at seven sharp, so we ask you to be on board at 6.45. Uh, they'll pull the gangway away two minutes ahead. And bring with you a ticket, the ticket for the cruise. And there's a, a much cruder version of the map on this slide. On the back of that ticket, it gets you across. Um, bring your main badge and a boarding pass. This is to keep track of people who actually got on, on the cruise having had a ticket. And bring a jacket. It's Canada, that girl. Uh, the cruise is divided into two halves. We start at 7 and do what, what, what you know, the dinner phase of the cruise where we feed you. There's music on board this, these boats. Uh, and for those of you at conferences I've been to, there are many who an hour and a half on a boat is enough. We go back to the dock and those of you who had enough of the water can get off and the rest of us can continue the sunset part of the cruise um, until 10 o'clock. Uh, I think that covered everything. This is for George Lester and all the pilots of the audience. That's today's aviation weather forecast. And at the bottom, it tells us we're going to have pretty good weather. It's going to be actually the latest uh, green bottom. It's actually going to be mostly clear with cloudy breaks. We get some daytime convection. If the high is going to be only 63 or 4 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 Celsius, I listen to an early, early broadcast and they realize how we're going to design. There will be gusty winds in the afternoon that will be dying down by evening. So it should be a very good evening, so it's going to be cool, so bring it back. And finally, and finally, for the students out there, because of the generous donations and, the, and our recruiting tax situation, we are offering banquet tickets to all students, COCUS and non-COCUS, that want to come to the banquet. You have to be active in this, in getting your ticket. You go show yourself at the registration desk and, and grab your ticket for Thursday night banquet. That's the word to those that are not here this morning because of the hospitality suites last night. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. We will call upon John Armour to introduce the plenary lecture. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce the Hoover Award winner. This is tradition at this meeting that 
the uh, first speaker is the Hoover Award Bee. If you don't know him already, that's Dr. Leo Panzer from uh, DuPont. I have a few words to say, uh, which uh, the only partial recognition of the uh, receipt of this award, but uh, let me proceed. The award is being given for his successful efforts to the leadership, discovery, and development of uh, new catalysts for the synthesis of alternatives of fluorocarbons. <coughs> Leo was uh, born and educated in Canada. He got his BS degree at the University of Waterloo in 1970, his PhD in organometallic chemistry in 1973, and he joined DuPont thereafter and has worked uh, in a number of different technical and management assignments in both Delaware and Texas since then. He has uh, received a number of awards in the past for his excellence in the catalysis, uh, and some of these include the 1995 ACS Award for Creative Leadership in R&D Management, the 1997 Award for Philadelphia Council Society, the 1998 Award by the Chemical Institute of Canada, uh, which was a lecture tour, and uh, the 1997 Heroes of Chemistry Team Award, for which his team was acknowledged for new catalysts for the production of phosgene. Leo has, uh, has been named as an inventor or co-inventor of 60 U.S. patents, uh, he has authored of over 80 publications, and uh, most impressively, he has given more than 130 lectures in more than 25 countries. Uh, Leo is a fellow in uh, the DuPont Central Research uh, Science and Engineering Laboratories at the Experimental Station in Wilmington, Delaware. The title of this talk is Catalytic Synthesis of Fluorocarbons, Past, Present, and Future. Leo. introduction. I, I really appreciate it, and congratulations to you on being the next uh, president of the uh, North American Catalysis Society. It's going to be uh, fun to see what you do to keep this thing going. Um, <laughs> electrons, I see, have flowed properly this morning. I was wondering how I was going to work with dual pointers here on two screens. I haven't figured out how to do that, so I'll have to use my mouse here, and hopefully that'll, that'll work out. It's really an honor to receive this award. I mean, it's such a, a prestigious award, and to get it here in Canada, uh, only 100 miles or so from where I received my bachelor's and PhD degrees in Waterloo in Western Ontario is, is really uh, uh, important to me, and, and I'm delighted to, to be here this morning. I was very sorry to hear about uh, John Moffat's wife, uh, Elmer, and her upcoming surgery. I was hoping he would be here since he taught me physical chemistry and thermodynamics at Waterloo as an undergraduate there. And John was a very tough guy. Those of you that know him will, can appreciate what a, what a teacher he was. I remember very distinctly walking into his laboratories to ask him a question on fugacity or something strange like that. And uh, looking around in his lab and seeing all this equipment, I said, gee, what is all this for? He says, this measures surface science and materials. I said, why would you want to do that? So, little did I know I was going to get involved in heterogeneous catalysis when I was studying organic chemistry. Anyways, having uh, uh, the opportunity to give a lecture and, and been involved in, in a wide variety of catalysis over the years at DuPont, I thought a lot about what I wanted to tell you about, and I decided to concentrate on fluorocarbons. It's an area that's foreign to most of you, and that's why I decided to do it. But it's one of the most exciting areas of catalysis that I've been involved with. So that's what we're going to do here today. First of all, I wanted to recognize uh, Eugene Houdry for his accomplishments in the field of catalysis. I mean, this man was a real giant in the field, developing the first catalytic cracking catalyst in the early 1930s. And I didn't know this, but actually inventing the catalytic converter in 1953. So look at the impact uh, Houdry has had on society. So it is a, uh, a very important award uh, to be recognized for. Decided to break down the development of fluorocarbon catalysis into four eras. The uh, first one, uh, or the, the first carbon fluorine bonds were actually made by Frederick Schwartz back in 1892. And over the next uh, 30 years or so, uh, this uh, catalysis evolved a little bit until 1930 when CFCs were uh, initially put into refrigeration applications. And I'll say more about each of these areas as we go into the uh, discussion a little bit more. 
For the next 50, 55 years or so, there was a huge amount of catalysis done uh, to make carbon fluorine uh, chemicals or fluorochemicals to go in a variety of applications. And then in the middle 1980s, when the hole over the Antarctic was observed, uh, there was a mad rush to develop replacements for uh, uh, coral fluorocarbons. I'll talk about these first three eras uh, in about 15 minutes. So I'm not going to dwell on the past. I'm going to talk more about where I see some future applications are in the synthesis of uh, carbon fluorine bonds. And those areas, I believe, are in uh, specialty chemicals, uh, telecommunication areas, optical fiber coatings, uh, pharmaceutical and egg chemical intermediates. So that's where we'll be going for the next 45 minutes or so. So back in uh, 1892, Frederick Schwartz uh, found that he could react uh, activated carbon chlorine bonds, such as that allylic CCL3 bond there, with antimony trifluoride to replace the carbon chlorine bonds uh, with fluorine to make uh, the CF3 group there. It was not catalytic, it was stoichiometric chemistry, but it was the first synthesis of carbon uh, chlorine bonds. Uh, he evolved that chemistry nicely, but in 1928, uh, uh, Thomas Midgley and Albert Penn at the Frigidaire Division of General, General Electric, General Motors, uh, were asked to come up with new safe refrigerants instead of using ammonia and uh, materials like uh, SO3 and so on, they were asked to come up with stable refrigerants. So after looking very carefully at a variety of materials, uh, Thomas Midgley decided that chlorofluorocarbons <coughs> were the right materials for new refrigeration systems. And we've shown in the synthesis there of uh, uh, dichloro and difluoromethane, CFC12, from carbon tetrachloride and ammonia trifluoride. And it was a meeting like this at the American Chemical Society in 19... 34, I believe it was, when he stood up in front of a large group, inhaled a, a breath full of uh, CFC-12 and blew out a candle, showing how non-toxic and non-flammable these materials were. He was extremely lucky because he had several vials of antimony trifluoride, and most of these ampules had phosgene in them. And he picked the one ampule that did not have any phosgene, and he used that to make the CFC-12, and of course he was, everything was fine. And he picked the wrong one, he would have dropped over dead probably, and CFCs would never have gone any further. <laughs> but that's the way it was. He was also the inventor of tetraethyl lead, so he's got uh, quite a legacy. Anyways, uh, having decided 12 was the right material uh, for refrigeration systems, uh, they decided to commercialize, and the General Motors did not have a lot of experience in handling high-pressure chlorine, high-pressure HF, so a joint venture with DuPont was formed called Kinetics Chemicals. And uh, this uh, uh, company, this small joint venture, commercialized the synthesis of CFCs and uh, learned to adjust the temperature and pressure during these reactions to make more highly fluorinated uh, CFCs as shown on the top slide there, so you can make a wide variety of, of coral fluorocarbons. And then down in the bottom box there, you'll see the major coral fluorocarbons that were developed over a period of years for a whole wide variety of applications, and it serves society uh, extremely well. Well, it turned out that you couldn't fluorinate uh, many materials with the liquid phase antimony systems, so it was important to develop gas phase heterogeneous catalyst to make the more fluorinated materials. And what you'll find as I go through my talk today, that the workhorse of the industry really is chromium oxide. And there are a wide variety of chromium oxide materials uh, that have been used over the years. The uh, first one was this material, ADA's green, which is actually a pigment. On my screen, it's a bright uh, turquoise color. I don't know what it looks like out there. But it's made from uh, boric acid and, and sodium dichromate. Uh, in a couple of steps there, you eventually make a hydrated Cr2O3, uh, shown right here, which is then uh, dehydrated to make a catalyst, and that has been used since the middle 1960s to make more fluorinated, highly fluorinated materials. Another way to make an active and a very, very good catalyst is to reduce chromium-6 with ethanol. That gives another version of chromium dioxide. Uh, and, or, uh, chroma 3 oxide, and that's been used by DuPont since 1960 as well to make uh, the more fluorinated materials like chloro, pentafluoroethane, CFC 115. 
fairly high surface area, but the best catalyst that we have found in all of the work we've done over the years is to make uh, chromium, alpha chromium oxide by the volcano reaction that many of you, when you could still do chemistry in high school, would decompose ammonium dichromate, lots of gas would come off, you'd evolve nitrogen, and you could make this material alpha chrome oxide. And this is absolutely a phenomenal uh, fluorination catalyst. And we've been asking ourselves for many years, what makes this better than anything else? And quite honestly, we still don't know the answer to that question yet. So you'll see a chromium oxide uh, used throughout the talk today. Uh, you won't know which way, uh, has, which process has been used to make that chromium oxide, but you'll see it's used all over the place. Well, things that changed in, 19, in the middle 1980s, the uh, Tom's mapping images of the Earth start to show uh, on the left there in that box the hole appearing over the Antarctic uh, at certain times of the year. As a result of that, uh, the scientists and the, and the uh, communities of the world got together and decided it was important to phase out the chloral fluorocarbons just in case uh, they were responsible for the formation or formation of the ozone hole. So the Montreal Protocol, which was a major environmental treaty signed in Montreal back in September of 1987, called for the phase out of coral fluorocarbons by the year 1995. But there were variations on the Montreal Protocol over the next uh, several years, uh, speeding up the phase out of CFCs. But a major event happened in 1988, when all of the scientists, the atmospheric scientists in the world, there were over 100 of them, got together, reviewed all of the data, and decided that CFCs were really responsible for the, the, the ozone hole in the Antarctic. And within uh, a day, days of that announcement, DuPont, who were the largest producers of CFCs, announced the phase out of CFCs and the development of alternatives. And that started a global race by all of the companies to develop new materials to replace the chloral fluorocarbons. Well, there are all kinds of uh, ideas. Uh, it was believed initially the ozone layer was caused by extraterrestrials sitting out there in their spaceships and blowing holes in the ozone layer. Uh, there was some belief that there were snowballs coming in from, from, the, from the outside worlds, and these uh, snowballs were blasting holes in the ozone layer. And all of this science caused McDonald's here in the Globe and Mail from Toronto to announce that they were uh, going to stop using the, the clam shells that we used to use uh, to keep our hamburgers warm. So that was announced in, in 1987. And then the really big announcement was DuPont in March of 1988 causing for the phase out of CFC. So this was really it. All the companies out there that were our competitors decided to grab on to our market share and develop CFCs ahead of us. So that was when the race started. Even playing field for everybody. Over the next several years, there were a wide variety of alternatives developed to replace CFCs. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side there, there's about a dozen or so major hydrochlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons that were developed to replace the three main CFCs shown on the, on the left-hand side there. So this was a big job. There was no single replacement for any of these chloral fluorocarbons. A wide variety of materials had to be looked at and developed. I'm not going to go into the chemistry on any of these uh, materials. Uh, I've done that in the past, and you can read about it. I'm going to concentrate on a few slides for the top molecule there, 134A, which is now in all new uh, uh, car air conditioning systems and, and most of the commercial refrigeration systems. Back in 1986, when, just before we announced the phase out, we all got together at DuPont. We put together this chart uh, for 134A. We said, okay, how, what's the best way to make 134A shown in the middle there? And we didn't know at that time. So we had to look at all of these routes and decide which was the most attractive to go after. And uh, there are lots of uh, paths, lots of catalysts that were worked on for these, these various routes. But I'm going to concentrate on only one reaction. That's the reaction of... of well, the second step of this process starting from trichloroethylene going through that molecule 133A trichloroethylene and then on to 134A. So I'm going to talk about this reaction shown in red here since that's been the, the route that has been commercialized by most of the companies in the world. <clears throat> when we started looking at that and other companies started looking at it in the late 70s actually for the first time there were big issues associated with this, <clears throat> this top reaction. It's an equilibrium-limited reaction, stoichiometric amounts of HF, 
will cause only a 3% conversion of the uh, 133A to the tetrafluoroethane. So to drive that equilibrium reaction requires very large ratios of HF, something like 30 to 1 fed to the uh, reactor. Well, that means a lot of recovery, a lot of recycle, a lot of cooling down, very expensive process. So the ratio was a big issue. The other problem was that the catalyst died within minutes initially. And that was believed to be due to the fact that uh, HCl and HF are eliminated from that molecule 133A in the upper uh, left-hand corner to give the uh, olefin and then the fluorochloroacetylene. This polymerizes on the catalyst surface and decomposes the catalyst very quickly. So this was the state of the art in the uh, late 80s. Uh, and since that time, there have been some major advances in improving both of these issues. <clears throat> so we're looking at the top reaction there, the 133A plus HF, to exchange that one fluorine to make tetrafluoroethane. If you look down in the uh, graph down below, you can see uh, some data showing the effect of promoting chromium-3 oxide with zinc at different levels. This is a patent by ICI. And you can see there's an optimum there at around 2.7% zinc in the chromium-3 oxide. And by adding that zinc in there, it has a big effect on improving the yield in the process. And actually, we cut way down on the amount of HF that's fed to the reactor because it's believed that the zinc is increasing the local concentration of HF around the chromium and, and causing higher conversions to take place. So uh, that was a, a major advance uh, by ICI. Other companies shown on the, on the chart there, Osamount, Adokim, and others, uh, had similar types of patents where they had promoted uh, chromium oxide with zinc, uh, magnesium, nickel, and so on to increase catalyst life. So, you know, it's one of those good examples where if you, if you stick with something and, and study the surface science, study the mechanisms, you can make improvements in it. I remember looking at this reaction saying, gosh, we're never going to be able to improve the lifetime in this, in this reaction. But, but good surface science, good design has worked out very well. And that's, those are the commercial catalysts used today by those companies, I believe. Well, we had looked at all of those reactions and over a period of 10 years, built pilot plants all around the, the country and have a number of commercial facilities running around the world. And you can see that we have done a major development effort in New Jersey. A lot of our work was done at our Conoco refinery when we own Conoco in Ponca City, Oklahoma. And the world's first commercial plant to make uh, HCFC-123 actually is down the road uh, in Maitland, Ontario, which is the other end of, of Lake Ontario. So that was a, a nice event for Canada to be the first to have the first commercial uh, 123 plant. So uh, the work on this chart represents about $500 million that DuPont spent in the development of catalysts and, and applications for chlorofluorocarbon. So it was a, a very, very large effort. Other companies spent similar amounts of money, and there have been a lot of patents and publications uh, as a result of this effort over the years. You can see that uh, the effort peaked around 1996 with roughly uh, 550 or so patents and publications coming out in that year. Uh, things are tailing off a little bit. Uh, looks like the patents continue because there still is an opportunity for some new materials that I'll mention a little, little bit later to make uh, uh, HFCs uh, for specific applications. So a lot of activity there. The cost to society has been pretty large. Uh, an estimate in 1997 uh, was that globally it has been about $37 billion spent by all companies to transition away from CFCs to CFC alternatives. So it has been a, a very, very large effort, uh, but we're there. I think the transition has gone very, very well, and uh, things are, are happening in the upper atmosphere. This is a chart that I pulled down off the one of the websites out there. And the top uh, two uh, lines there are the atmospheric concentrations of CFC 11 and 12. And you can see that about 1994, as a result of the, the cutbacks, the concentration in the upper atmosphere started to level out, which was a good sign. You can see there was a nice increase prior to that, but everything is starting to level out in the upper atmosphere. And in fact, uh, the chart for CFC 11 has a little bit shorter atmospheric lifetime. It's starting to slope downward a little bit. So it's going to be a while before we, we get all of the 11 and 12 out of the atmosphere. They have long atmospheric lifetimes. But those levels should be back to 1978 levels by about the year 2050. So there 
be a slow decline, but at least it's not going up. For the less stable materials, such as methyl chloroform and carbon tetrachloride, you can see that they're already dropping off very nicely. Methyl chloroform uh, started uh, about 1990 there, and it's, it dropped very, very dramatically over the years. So uh, I think uh, things are happening now, and it was the right decision to phase out CFCs and to go on to new materials. What I'd like to do now is move away from CFCs and concentrate on new opportunities for fluorocarbon catalysis, primarily in the pharmaceutical and agricultural business. And I'll be talking about the synthesis of fluorinated monomers. The value of these monomers on this chart increase as we go down the slide. Tetrafluoroethylene, uh, commonly known as the polymer to many of you as Teflon, uh, goes for around $2.50 a pound. You know, compare that to less than a dollar a pound for 134A. So these are, are valuable, intermediate valuable uh, monomers. Hexafluoropropylene is, is much more expensive than tetrafluoroethylene. And when you get down to that last new monomer that I'll tell you about, perfluorodimethyldioxalane, uh, the polymer is called Teflon AF, that goes for around $3,000 a pound. Uh, so high value, low volume materials, and I'll show you how, we're making, how we are making that material. So Teflon AF polymer is the polymer derived from the monomer shown on the, on the very right hand part of the chart there. And you've got the two fluorines at the top of the molecule. That's polymerized by itself, or it's polymerized with tetrafluoroethylene ethylene to make a, a copolymer. Phenomenal properties of these polymers. Very high glass transition temperature of over 330 degrees. This makes an amorphous uh, fluoroplastic. Uh, these fluoroplastics are soluble in fluorocarbon solvents. You can make very nice thin films. Uh, the films have outstanding optical clarity, so you can put them on, on uh, microscopes and, and uh, all kinds of optical uh, lenses. Low refractive index, uh, low surface tension. Great uh, material for uh, fiber optics uh, applications and so on. So uh, this is the uh, this is the molecule that, that we are making today. Terrible process to make this in a horrible uh, intermediate. You start off on the left there with hexafluoroacetone, uh, react that with ethylene oxide, two nasty materials. You make the molecule called 456 there. Uh, the the this uh, trifluoromethyldioxalane. The next step is a uh, an uncatalyzed, uh, uh, currently an uncatalyzed uh, chlorination to get the tetrachlorinated product, and then a selective exchange of only two of the chlorines to get the difluoral dichloral intermediate there, the D418, and that's dechlorinated to give the olefin. And it's extremely reactive, and the, the, the reason the catalysis that I'll be talking about is so difficult because a trace amount of acid causes that material 456 to, to zip right back to uh, hexafluoroacetone. So the main catalyst that you look at for these reactions, all you see is uh, hexafluoroacetone coming out of your GC. So it's important to get the right supports and the right catalyst. <clears throat> so what we're looking at then is a catalytic process to take the, the left-hand molecule there over to the perchlorinated material. And you can see in the graph at the, uh, the bottom left-hand side uh, the concentration as a function of temperature of each of the chlorinated intermediates. We actually never see the monochlorinated product. It goes right on to the dichloral. By the time you get up to 215 degrees, uh, you can see that uh, we are making primarily the, the trichloral uh, material. And then going a little higher in temperature, we end up making the tetrachlorinated product in very high yield, uh, in well over 95% yield. We have run this reaction, and it does, catalyst does not deactivate. It's a very smooth chlorination reaction. Choice of the carbon, however, is extremely critical, because as I mentioned, if you're not careful, you can unzip it backwards to uh, decompose it back to hexafluoro acetone. So carbon was important. The appropriate choice of metals on that carbon was important. And uh, copper is, is one of the better metals, copper chloride on carbon for that particular reaction. So it looks like a, an ex it is an excellent uh, chlorination uh, catalyst. The next step is to catalytically exchange the chlorines uh, for fluorine. We want to stop at two fluorines. 
And it gets even more complicated because we want to make only the trans isomer uh, shown as the third uh, molecule in the series there. Uh, the, the cis isomer and the dechlorination step does not work as well. We can't isomerize the cis to the trans isomer uh, relatively easily, but we wanted to stop with the trans isomer. Once again, chromium trioxide, the first catalyst in that uh, table at 170 degrees, degrees works very, very nicely. 100% conversion, and we can make a little over a, a four, to, actually a over four to one ratio now of the trans to cis isomer. Other catalysts, such as zinc in the bottom there, you can actually make more cis than you do trans. So uh, it was quite a job to find a catalyst to, to make uh, the cis or the trans isomer in very high yield. This is actually commercial today. <clears throat> Let's move on now to the next monomer uh, down in value, hexafluoropropylene. Uh, one of the major applications today is in fuel cells. Uh, DuPont has recently formed a fuel cell enterprise working with a number of customers. Uh, we are fuel neutral. I've shown a chart here looking at uh, methanol as a fuel to that fuel cell and the membrane electrode assembly, but the guts in the heart of fuel cells is the, uh, the MEA shown here. Uh, very important to have a membrane that allows the protons to cross uh, from the anode department to the cathode department and not allow the, in this case, methanol to, to cross over into the other compartment. So, Natheon is currently widely used in fuel cell applications, and with all of the work that's going on, there are many sessions at this meeting on uh, new opportunities for fuel cells and good catalysis that's going on. And uh, it's possible that Natheon, or derivatives of Natheon, will be used in future applications. So, if, if everybody in this room is successful, uh, we should see fuel cells and automobile in cars and other applications uh, in just a few years. So if this happens, uh, DuPont, if, if we are the only producers of Natheon, we're going to require additional capacity. The structure of Natheon is very, very complicated. So I've shown the structure here on this chart. It's uh, made up of two monomers, primarily and derivatives of those monomers, tetrafluoroethylene and uh, uh, hexafluoropropylene, uh, shown there in red on the chart. So, as I said, if the fuel cell opportunities go as we hope they will, we're going to require new capacity to make uh, hexafluoropropylene uh, for Natheon or Natheon-like membranes. Today, it's, it, the process is run as it has been run for maybe 40 years. It's a, a thermal reaction starting with methane chlorinating and chloroform. Chloroform reacted with HF to give uh, difluorochloromethane, CFC12, which is then heated up at about 500 degrees centigrade to pyrolyze it. Gives you difluorocarbene radicals, which then combine together to make uh, tetrafluoroethylene. Then you go up in temperature a little bit higher, and the tetrafluoroethylene reacts with further with difluorocarbenes to give hexafluoropropylene, shown in the bottom right-hand uh, part of that chart. It's a high investment process, not a lot of control in, in selectivity except by raising the temperature, and it does give uh, small amounts of the next homolog in the series, the C4, for fluoroisobutylene, which is extremely toxic. So uh, we were interested in developing a new way to make hexafluoropropylene that did not make the toxic perfluoroisobutylene byproduct and one that allowed us to make it directly from low-cost feedstocks. There is no, it's like 134A, there is no direct route to hexafluoropropylene from propylene or propane, chlorine, and HF. There are many, many uh, options available to look at. We've looked at many of these. And I'm going to talk today only about two pathways to make hexafluoropropylene. On the right hand side is a route we call the olefin route, going through unsaturated intermediates down to hexafluoropropylene. And then on the left side, the one I'll talk about first, involves completely uh, saturated materials on the way to hexafluoropropylene. <clears throat> this chart shows the uh, product distribution as a function of uh, contact time. When you start with propylene, react with chlorine and HF over a chrome chloride and carbon catalyst. If you look at the top line, you can see that the total yield is very, very high. The, the first time you run this reaction, you see uh, dozens of peaks in the gas chromatograph, and you say, whoa, we've got a long ways to go here. 
But if you look at it, you'll find that the major product in there that we're interested in is the one down here. If you can see at the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand corner, the tri, the, the dichloral hexafluoral propane. That's where we want to go. But all of those other materials in the on the GC initially that you make are all precursors. They can all be very, very easily recovered, recycled back through the process to give us the overall high 99 or so percent yield that you can achieve in this reaction. So I'll show you a little more detail on the next slide. Starting with uh, propylene or, or propane, it really doesn't matter with chlorine and HF over the catalyst shown uh, there. Uh, you can make 216A dichloral hexafluoropropane propane in about 50 to 60 percent single pass yield. An excellent catalyst that only takes place if you promote the chrome with a little bit of cobalt. Uh, iron chloride is a pretty good catalyst with a perovskite, lanthanum cerium, uh, chrome oxide works reasonably well for that reaction. So the overall yield is about 97 percent directly to that 216AA, that's about half of the product mix. Now the next job is to take the, the two chlorines in the middle and to exchange only one of those with HF to make the heptafluoral uh, propane. And that, that's done with uh, chromium oxide. It's a, it's a difficult reaction. Those two chlorines are tightly bonded. Once you start to exchange one, it's very easy to exchange the second one. And if you're not careful, uh, you'll make perfluoral propane, which is OK. It's a high value uh, material that's used in electronic uh, etching of, of silicon chips. Uh, but we really wanted to stop the reaction at the at the monochloro derivative there, the 217BA, and chromium oxide will give around 87 to 90% selectivity at relatively low conversion. The next reaction is to make the olefin. And this is some very fine work uh, done by Bill Bono. And look, I mean, just, just look at that reaction. You're taking a very stable uh, chlorofluorocarbon, you're reacting with hydrogen, ripping out HF and HCl to give hexafluoropropylene. And uh, Bill found that with catalysts, uh, a variety of materials supported on calcium fluoride. Calcium fluoride, by far, was the best support for this uh, dehydrochlorination reaction. Uh, promoting it with potassium is also a very important finding in that reaction. Look at the selectivity, 97% selectivity to hexafluoropropylene at 400 and uh, about 450 degrees or so uh, centigrade. So very nice piece of work, uh, very little catalyst deactivation in that process. So that's the, the saturated route uh, to hexafluoropropylene. I'll now switch over to the unsaturated route that we have also looked at in, in a lot of detail, starting off at the top with propylene and propane, going to the olefin, trifluoral, trichloral uh, propylene, fluorinating that, and then and then getting eventually to hexafluoral propylene. It's really some fascinating catalysis. So here we are uh, taking a catalyst with chlorine and an HF on the top, and we're interested in making unsaturates. I mean, it's pretty amazing that chlorine does not add to that material. HF does not add to that double bond with these systems. But choosing the catalyst as usual, uh, you can do a lot of things. Cobalt chloride now is the best catalyst for making unsaturated uh, uh, floral, floral type olefins. Uh, you can see in the bottom the graph there on the very right hand side the reaction that you get with cobalt chloride by itself. You make mostly the trifluoral, trichloral ethylene, propylene, and you make some of that molecule 214, which is in fact saturated, but it very, very easily eliminates chlorine and goes on to the tetrafluoral, chloral ethylene. So uh, those are all. Uh, precursors in this unsaturated route. If you don't, the cobalt chloride with various materials are shown in the chart. On the left-hand side, a little bit of calcium in there, you can get up to around 95% overall yield to the combined products of the 12-13 and basically 12-14, the tri- and tetrafluoral uh, propylene. So those are the materials now that we'll take on to the next step. And here we are again, another remarkable reaction, uh, taking uh, trifluoro, trichloropropylene, reacting it with HF, not adding the HF, but exchanging the HF to make those two olefinic intermediates, the penta and the tetrafluoral uh, materials. Uh, chromium oxide is not a good catalyst by itself for that reaction. You can see the other yield is around 
around 71% because it's a good addition catalyst. It makes saturated materials. But if you modify it with a little bit of zinc chloride, you can change the uh, product distribution very significantly and get nearly 100% conversion of the 1213 there on the left over to the right-hand material, uh, 1215, which is what we want. So we're now going to take that pentafluoral propane and we're going to convert it to hexafluoral propylene in another uh, really interesting reaction. This is a disproportionation reaction. We're feeding on the left there the pentafluoral uh, propane. We're scrambling the fluorines around the double bond to make an equilibrium distribution. And that equilibrium distribution is shown on the chart here. The vertical black line is what happens if you feed pure 1215. It's got one chlorine in the feedstock. And down the bottom axis, you'll see the number of chlorines in the feed. If you feed pure 1215, you get a distribution shown there. The hexafluoropropylene is the line coming down uh, from the top left. So the more chlorine in the feed, the less hexafluoropropylene you make in the reaction. So it's very important in this distribution of products that you get out that you isolate the less fluorinated materials, the 1214 and 1213. Do not recycle them in this reaction, but take them back to the previous reactor, react it with HF, and build up the fluorines on the molecule so that you feed relatively pure 1215 to this reaction. Otherwise, the concentration of hexafluoropropylene drops way off. So I like this reaction. I think it's very, very nifty catalysis. The fact that you can keep uh, the double bond in there all the way through the process. Now the uh, astute reaction engineers in the group will recognize that chlorinating propane in these highly halogenated materials involves an awful lot of heat. And heat management has been a big issue in the development of this technology. 197 kcals per mole, you can take uh, propylene reacted with chlorine and HF to make the dichloral uh, hexafluoropropylene. propane. So a lot of heat there. So we decided, we looked at that and decided if we could find a way to make a chlorinated uh, propane or propylene and feed that to the reactions, it's one of these trade-offs that one worries about. But it was a better way to go to, to chlorinate the precursor, feed that to the reactions, and that saved investment down the road. The trouble is, uh, chlorinated materials such as the one in the second chart, the second uh, equation there, hexafluoropropylene, uh, propane, for example, was not readily available. So we had to come up with new methods to make these hydrochloral propanes. And the reactions are uh, telomer reactions. You take something like carbon tetrachloride, it adds across the double bond, uh, the top reaction there, uh, vanillin chloride or vinyl chloride or ethylene. And you can make uh, hydrochloral HCPs, hydrochloral propanes. And, and pretty good yield. The trouble is, the double, those materials then want to add again to additional olefins, so you start to build up then longer chain molecules. So the key was really stopping the reaction at the C3 rather than making C5s and C7s and C9s. Uh, that's done by using copper chloride. Very nice at stopping the reaction at the C3 step. Uh, the copper is promoted with heterocyclase such as the one shown there, the 2-ethyl oxazolone. And the choice of the solvent is critical. A dip in nitrile uh, works extremely well as a solvent for this liquid phase, homogeneous catalyzed reaction. So uh, by using this method, we've been able to make the hydrochloropropanes, which can then be fed to the reactions I've talked about in the last uh, a few charts or so here to make the hexafluoropropylene down the road. So that's gone very well, and these feedstocks uh, uh, do save investment. Now, all of this work, so that's where I'm going to stop right there. This work that I've talked about to make hexafluoropropylene has led into some new catalysis that is now being used to make new hydrofluorocarbons. So even though there's been a major transition over to the new materials, there's been no single replacement. There still needs uh, sitting out there. Uh, 236 FA, the molecule shown in the top right hand corner there, uh, hexafluoropropane, uh, we've just commercialized as a new uh, fire extinguishing agent. And uh, we've been able to get that by the process shown on the, on the top chart there for one of these hydrofluoropropanes. So it kind of builds on itself. Uh, chromium chloride on carbon is an excellent
some catalyst for that reaction shown it goes at 93% yield. Now there's also a need for an HFC blowing agent. Uh, HFC uh, 245FA, and we can get to that material by a number of pathways. If you look at the upper right hand corner, we can take the 236FA with palladium on carbon and uh, dehydrofluorinate that material to make the pentafluoral uh, propane 245FA. We can also get to it by starting with the pentachloral propane 240FA doing an uncatalyzed reaction to the olefin shown at the bottom, uh, in the bottom in the middle of the chart there, and then using our chromium oxyfluoride to hydrofluorinate and back up. So, you know, all of this work over the years has paid off in developing new routes to new HFCs that we're interested in today. Let me move now over to the final part of the talk, and that has to do with the synthesis of, of high value, low volume type materials, primarily for the agrochemical and pharmaceutical industries. Here's a, a table that Eric Banks put together in 1995, showing the volume in the world of uh, floral bins, the floral aromatics. Not large volumes, you know, we're talking normally hundreds of millions of pounds and the sort of things that DuPont works with. Now we're only looking at uh, 4,500 or so uh, tons per year. Low volume, but high value type materials. <clears throat> These are widely used in agricultural and pharmaceutical intermediate theory. All of the new pharmaceuticals you see have carbon fluorine bonds in them somewhere. And I've shown just five examples on this chart. I get a kick out of the names that are chosen for these materials. Uh, these are like, this Cougar, and Cascade, and Force, and Nusar. Our interest was initially in Newstar, a uh, 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 pesticide that DuPont uh, makes and, and, using, and uses uh, floral benzene in that reaction. But look at some of these molecules. Look at the one by Zenith in their force. You've got a, a tetrafloral, uh, uh, tetrafloral toluene derivative. And these materials are very, very hard to make. And it's not unusual to pay 30 40 50 $100 a pound for some of the intermediates that go into these into these specialty chemical opportunities. So uh, those are some of the areas that, that we and other companies are looking at. Now the synthesis of aromatic uh, fluorine compounds uh, has been around a long time. Difficult chemistry, it's waste producing. Uh, reaction shown at the top there is what's used by nearly everybody today to make fluorobenzene, the Balthus-Schiemann reaction. Uh, it goes through the synthesis of a diazonium salt, so you're making lots of waste every pound of fluorobenzene that is produced. Another way to make more highly fluorinated aromatics is to use uh, cobalt trifluoride. Uh, that uh, does a fine job in fully saturating anything that's unsaturated in the, in the molecule. And then you defluorinate with iron to make lots of iron fluoride. So another uh, waste generating process, but you can make highly fluorinated materials by that process. Another method is to take uh, potassium fluoride and exchange chlorine in these aromatic uh, materials. Once again, this generates all kinds of waste. It is selective, but it works reasonably well. But as we think and worry more about the environment, it's important that we find uh, waste-free processes. And today I'm going to tell you for the first time about some new catalysis that we have developed to make fluorinated aromatics that, do not, that does not make any waste at all. There is no direct route known up to this point. And the reason for that is you cannot take a carbon-hydrogen bond with HF like you can with, with other uh, types of materials and make a carbon-fluorine bond. The HF bond is just so very strong, 135 kcals per mole. So there's no way you can do it directly. People have tried to do uh, fluorinations, oxyfluorination reactions unsuccessfully, uh, but we've now found a way to get there uh, and you feed oxygen in the process along with HF that drives the thermodynamics and you can in fact make carbon fluorine bonds and co-produce water. Now, this does require good engineering. HF and water are extremely corrosive, but if you do it right, you can uh, run this properly. The key to the reaction is shown on the upper graph in the upper chart there, the upper equation. We take a metal fluoride, and the choice of that metal fluoride is very, very important. It's a high valent metal fluoride. It will oxidize a carbon-hydrogen bond to make a carbon-fluorine bond. The metal fluoride is reduced all the way down to the zero valent metal fluoride. It liberates HF, which can be recycled with oxygen to give the high valent metal fluoride again. So it is a stoichiometric reaction. 
reaction that is recyclable in a cyclic mode. Uh, it may be possible to do that in a continuous mode, but I'm going to talk about the, the cyclic mode uh, uh, this week. So that's the overall reaction. You're taking a CH bond with oxygen and HF to make a carbon fluorine bond. And the choice of the, the metal, as I said, is very, very important. I've shown an example here with copper uh, difluoride, cupric fluoride at 400 degrees. It gives fluorobenzene in nearly quantitative yields. Uh, copper zero is produced in the reaction, so you can turn off the benzene, turn on the air, uh, flow HF over the copper zero, and it goes back to cupric fluoride again, and you can do this uh, many, many times. It's completely recyclable and works nicely to give fluorobenzene. Our estimates are that the cost of fluorobenzene by this process is less than a third of the chemistry used to make fluorinated aromatics today. So it's a great reaction. Uh, if you support the copper fluoride, you've got a higher surface area, so you can get higher conversion per pass. Uh, I'll be talking a lot more about this reaction at another talk on Thursday morning. I think it's like 10.30 or so. So that's all I wanted to say about the oxychlorination reaction, but it is another use uh, and another opportunity for the synthesis of carbon fluorine bonds. On well, the last few minutes here, I wanted to show you just another another way to make carbon fluorine bonds and aromatics with uh, tetrafluoroethylene to give that cyclic C4. It gives a difluorotoluene. The next reaction is an add-up between the same diene with uh, hexafluoropropylene to give eventually a uh, fluoro trifluoral uh, xylene derivative. You can take the diene with hexafluoropropylene to make ortho, fluoro, trifluoro, methylbenzene, and you can take styrene, for example, with tetrafluoroethylene in the bottom here to make uh, difluoroethylene. So you can go crazy with all kinds of uh, different dyes, different fluorinated materials, and build up a whole family of fluorinated aromatics that could be used uh, downstream in a variety of, of reactions. So that's uh, pretty much all I wanted to say today. I wanted to summarize uh, uh, with a few comments. I hope I've shown you that fluorocarbon catalysis is extremely uh, interesting. It's fascinating. It's a lot of fun uh, work. If you can't have fun, you might as well move on and do something else. Uh, but we've had a great time doing all this catalysis over the years. Unfortunately, we don't understand a lot of the chemistry or the mechanisms. There are all kinds of unknowns in here. A number of uh, academic groups have started looking at some of this catalysis, and, and I hope you've been intrigued by some of these reactions, and maybe we'll start to apply a little science to, to some of these areas. The value to society is clearly there. Uh, CFCs have been phased out at a cost of $40 billion. Atmospheric levels of CFCs are dropping, so uh, it has been a, a successful transition. It's been great to be, be part of that uh, process. Uh, it has gone very well. And there are new opportunities now uh, for many companies. We have to please Wall Street. We can't get low returns anymore. We have to look for high value opportunities. And I think you've seen some of these, these opportunities in the fluorinated monomers and intermediates for the especially chemical businesses. And there still is a challenge. I showed you one example on how to make aromatics without using chlorine initially uh, in the synthesis of uh, of other materials, uh, we still need new ways to make uh, carbon fluorine bonds. Carbon fluorine bonds are going to be around for a very, very long time. And we need to get away from the use of chlorine. <clears throat> I think chlorine is going to be here for a long time as well, but we need to develop new synthetic roads to materials. So, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, a number of people. There have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people at DuPont and academic uh, uh, universities, national laboratories that we've worked with over the years. I've shown just a very few people that I have worked very closely with for a very number, a large number of years, and I want to, to thank these uh, folks uh, very much for, for their uh, uh, discussions over the years. And finally, I wanted to thank Sue Kami for continuing to support the, uh, the Foodry Award, I know it's very difficult to come up with money these days to continue to support these types of awards, and I think it's important that we, uh, we recognize Sue Kimmy for their ongoing support of the Foodry Award, and uh, I particularly want to thank them for doing that. So, that's all I have to say here today. I want to thank you for coming out. So,
early in the morning listening to this area. I hope you're able to follow most of it. It's a hard area to follow if you're not working in it, but uh, uh, it has been exciting, and I've enjoyed it for many, many years. Thanks very much for your time.